God is good and all the time. Just in case you are new and you weren't ready for that, let's do that again, all right? God is good and all the time. We're glad that you chose to worship with us today. My name is John, and I am blessed to serve as the pastor here at this amazing church. What a legacy this church has. Aren't you thankful for the legacy of this church? Yeah, you can clap. It's... uh, I think it it points to the faithfulness of God, Uh, but it also is fitting to honor the faithfulness of God's people. And uh, this church is filled uh, for 75 years with faithful men and women of God who uh, just want to see people find and follow Jesus. That's a great legacy, isn't it? And and the truth is, not every church has that legacy. And so I'm glad we get to celebrate that, that our our church has that legacy. We've been uh, kind of going through our core values. We've been calling them the hallmarks of Hallmark, and one of the verses that's kind of led the last few works is Hebrews 10, 23, and it'll be on the screen for us this morning, but I would like for us uh, to read that together this morning, all right? Hebrews 10, 23. Are you ready? Here we go. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised... Do you believe that? God is faithful, isn't he? And he has proven to be faithful to me personally and to this church for all these years. And, you know, I, uh, interesting, as a lot of reflection the last few weeks thinking about uh, my first service, the, the day we joined Hallmark Baptist Church, I was 24 years old, and it was the 50th anniversary celebration of Hallmark. Isn't that pretty amazing? So if I could make it 25 more years, I'll be here for the hundredth. Think I can make it? All right. I'll be 74 by then, so we'll see. All right. That's nothing, right? Some of you, that's like nothing for some of you out there. Do you know there's been seven, seven pastors at Hallmark in 75 years? I think of the legacy. I think of why would they start a church? I think it speaks to the core values of they were biblically driven, they were radically generous, they were personally involved, they were outwardly focused. And I never met Jesse Cockrum, maybe there's a couple of in here that did. He was the first pastor of this church. I'm thankful he felt the call of God to start a church, aren't you? Started down on Maddox Avenue, 1947. Pastor for just over a year, but the next pastor, Roy McGinnis. How many of you know Roy McGinnis? Anybody still here? All right. I see three hands that represent two people. Uh, I, I had to process that for a moment. Anyone else? Okay. Right over here, Miss Bessie Henson. Can we all wave to Miss Bessie? How are you doing, Bessie? It's great to see you. Yeah, you can give her a hand. That's all right. And he pastored here from 49 to 56. Then Alvis Edmondson pastored from 56 to 76. How many of you know Brother Edmondson? All right, look around. A lot of us. I I knew Brother Edmondson. I knew, I did not know the first two pastors, but I knew every pastor after that. Is anybody, any family members from Alvis Edmondson here? No, Miss Bessie, Ryan, anyone else? Just raise your hand. Awesome. What a legacy, 20 years. You know, He introduced Hallmark to Faith Promise Missions Giving. Think about that one decision to decide, hey, let's give above our tithes and give to missions. What a great great testimony. Um, Brother Raymond Dunn pastored from 76 to 1981. And I know some of his family members are here. Can you all raise your hand? (laughs) Family members of Brother Dunn, all right? You guys can give them a hand. Okay. Uh, I, I know them because um, Brother Dunn actually is my grandfather-in-law. And so uh, his two daughters, Judy and Jana, are down here. And one of them, Jana, happens to be my mother-in-law. She's the best mother-in-law I've ever had. <laughs> and I pray the only one I ever have, right? <laughs> How many of you were here when Brother Dunn? You know Brother Dunn, All right? A bunch of people. Raise your hand. That's awesome. Then Pastor Bob Baird. I don't know if any any relatives of of the Bairds here today, right? Melba over there, anyone else? 
I, you know, I got to, two weeks ago, two weeks ago yesterday, I got to talk with Ann Baird, and uh, she just said to tell you hi. She's doing great and loves Hallmark and just thankful for the time they got to spend here from 81 to 86. And then Brother Ed and Phyllis Walls, who are right here on the front. Can we give them a hand this morning? And uh, Brother Ed pastored the church uh, from 1986 to 1994. And it was his vision that God led him to purchase this property many years ago. 19, early 1990, 91, in that time period, they bought this property and I don't know, Ed, if you ever envisioned all this, but God, God used him in a great way to see all of what God did here just by you being faithful to God's call in your life. And I've asked Brother Ed if he would just come up and share a little bit. We've been talking about God's faithfulness, and so I just asked him if he would share a little about the time he was at Hallmark and, and maybe a story of God's faithfulness. So would you welcome Brother Ed to the platform today? take all my notes away so you don't steal my stuff, but <laughs> yes, sir. You know you've been away from Texas too long when mesquite trees look good to you. <laughs> it is good to be back at Hallmark. It is good to be back in Texas. We've just been here for a little while this morning, but it is good to see some old faces like Jimmy's, <laughs> but it is good to see so many new faces as well, because that tells me that the legacy of Hallmark Baptist Church continues, that it was not just for one generation or just for one time, but probably that's because the principles upon which this church are eternal, mm -hmm. the eternal Word of God, the eternal Son of God the eternal offering of redemption to whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord. Your pastors asked me to relate something about the time we were here concerning faithfulness. And frankly, I thought of faithful men that I worked with. I was privileged to work with Robert Singley. Most of the time, I felt like I was his associate. But then it came the day that God placed in our heart a vision to relocate. At that time, and Pastor John, I don't know how it is now, but at that time we had 12 deacons and 7 trustees. 19 men. And I always thought how unfair that was to any pastor because Jesus only had 12 And if you can imagine how it is to get 19 Texans to agree on anything, you could imagine what it was like when we began to look at land. Jimmy, I was thinking about this. I think we looked at probably about 10 parcels of land at that time. And land at that time was going per square foot. We were in a booming economy or just coming off of a booming economy. And then there was a crash and there was all kind of land available, but people thought it was more valuable than what it really was. And so it was going for dollars per square foot. I think the average cost was like on commercial land, $5 a square foot. You figure that out an acre and you will be amazed. Well, we whittled the process down to three pieces of property. There was a piece of property over on Hewlin. There was a piece of uh, property down on South Freeway, down toward Burleson. And then there was this ratty piece of property on Risinger Road. <laughs> and as we look at that, we thought, you know, this could really be a bad decision because Risinger Road did not go through at that time. And Hewlin Road did not go through at that time, but we thought to ourselves, what if? So it came the night that we were going to vote, and I thought, this is going to be fun. 
19 Texans in one room, men like Bob Young, who most of you will not remember. <laughs> Bob Young was an old raw bone Texan who, would, who could start a fight in an empty room. And Jimmy was in there, and Gary Morton, who I saw earlier, was there. But then there was also men who were of normal persuasion, <laughs> like Joe Ward, God bless him. Curly Henson was there, Frank Mercer, other names. Faithful men. And we prayed, and we voted, and we came up with each parcel of land and when it was all said and done, 19 faithful men voted unanimously to buy this piece of property on Reisinger Road. And Pastor John, you asked me if I ever envisioned this. I thought I had a pretty big vision, but I got to be honest with you. God had a bigger vision than me. And as I've been on this property for the last couple of days, I just thought, look what God has wrought. And I'm so glad that my wife and I got to be a small part of this along the way. And God bless you. I love you, Hallmark Baptist Church. Thank you for what you have done for missions. Thank you for what you have done for the gospel. Thank you for what you have done in my life. And God bless you for what you will do until Jesus returns. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you. What a great testimony, right? God, a faithful God uses faithful men and women, doesn't he? And you see it all throughout Scripture that, you know, God could do it without us, right? God doesn't need you. Does that just excite you today? God doesn't need you. But God chooses to use you. If you just say, yeah, God, I want to sign me up. I want to be a part of what you're doing. And uh, I'm, I'm thankful for Dave. I asked uh, Pastor Dave to come up, and Dave served here on staff for 17 years. Yeah, and uh, many, many of those years, I, uh, yeah, you can give my hand. Great. Love you, man. Love you. Wow. I'm done introducing you, I guess. Okay, yeah. Thank you, guys. That's what you get when you're the most recent guy. <laughs> so thank you. And uh, Stefan said so much has changed in 75 years, except my hairdo. I've had the same haircut <laughs> since I came back in 2004. And I'll tell you, uh, when we moved here, Devin, my oldest daughter, was six. Delaney was five. Danae was one. Drew was still in heaven with Jesus. And we had actually had a child at every, in every state where we served in every church. And when we moved to Texas, everybody was saying, okay, where's the Texas child? <laughs> no, nah, it'll never happen. Then God bless us with Drew 12 years ago. He is Texas-born, Texas-bred. Yes, he's, a, he's the Texan. Uh, but what can I say? Uh, 17 years summed up in five minutes. All four of my kids were baptized here, saved and baptized. That's priceless. And when John asked, how, how can you uh, describe God's faithfulness through Hallmark Baptist Church, three words came to mind. Bear with me. I'm a crier. Love. I saw God love through this church unconditionally. God taught me how to love unconditionally through this church. And uh, you all loved me. You all loved my family. You loved your community. You loved the world. And God said that that's proof that we belong to him. He said, people will know that you're my disciples by the love that you have one for another. God loved through you. Uh, God taught me about leadership here at Hallmark. I got to serve with some of the greatest men and women uh, that I've ever met in my life. And I learned from them. They taught me that you lead with 
humility, not pride. You lead by serving others, not by being served. Uh, that, that's how you lead. And, and I learned so much uh, from Pastor Mike Haley, uh, Pastor John Haley. You know, I'm a, new, I'm a new senior pastor myself, and I'm faced with some new decisions and new challenges. And every time I face them, I say, what would, what would Mike Haley do in this situation? What would John Haley do in this situation? I really do. I honestly do. I've called both of them and apologized to them for taking up so much of their time as a, as a selfish staff member, walking into their office, talking to them about the one thing that was consuming my mind, not realizing they had 20 other things on their mind and heart, but they took time for me, always had an open door, loved me and my family. I learned about love here at Hallmark. And finally, I learned about legacy. This church has an incredible legacy. You know what Hallmark's legacy is? Is missions. World evangelization. It's being faithful to God's call, to the great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And they have faithfully done that, not only corporately as a church, but I've seen individual families trade success for significance. They had success, and they laid it all down at the feet of Jesus and they chose significance. They committed their life to the great commandment, to the great commission. Sold everything, moved across the world, became missionaries. I saw it over and over and over again. Faithful men and women of God that have served on staff with us, trading success for significance. I think over and over again, this church has traded success for significance. Worldly success, things that would look good on the surface for the significant impact that they can make for eternity. And I think of Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 when I think of Hallmark Baptist Church. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church. By Christ Jesus, to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Love you, Hallmark. Thank you for letting me share today. And of course, I also asked Pastor Haley if he would just share a few short testimonies <laughs> today about uh, my dad came as the pastor at Hallmark in 1994, from 1994 to 2016. And uh, if I, re I, I was in college at the time, and I remember uh, coming home uh, to a new home in Fort Worth, and he drove me out to this property. And I remember saying, why did you guys buy cow pasture? That's what I was thinking. Like, there's, there was nothing out here. And uh, in, in the time that Pastor Haley was a pastor here, this is what God did. All, all of this, that God, God did that, but God uses faithful men to do things, doesn't he? And uh, so I'm thankful that, that I'm a part of that legacy, that my grandfather-in-law pastored here, my dad pastored here, and often I think, even as I was standing there this morning, why, how am I standing here? And I know you guys think the same, same thing sometimes. <laughs> I'm not that naive. I get it. But I want to ask my dad to come up and share just about God's faithfulness. Could we give him a hand this morning? Thank you. Be seated, please. I uh, I had to hug John and say I'm going to cry because <laughs> he's crying. But uh, I I know I have a time limit, so I I typed out what I'm going to say. <laughs> so just pray I stay with it, okay? I love the theme that we're doing. God is faithful, and uh, I too, when I came to Pastor Hallmark. I, I was so surprised and amazed that God would call me here. And everywhere I've served the Lord, it's been like a task that was way above me. Uh, I was in over my head, I thought. And, uh, and I knew I was. 
But it's a wonderful blessing to see what God does. And uh, it's a real joy to still get to come to Hallmark and to pray for my pastor. And uh, to, to know what he used to be to what he is today. Oh, it is. <laughs> Amen. Grace. Grace. So I, I just, uh, I'm just really blessed today. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9 says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. 2 Thessalonians 3.3 3 says, But the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And in 1 Thessalonians 2.24, it says, He who calls you is faithful. And it's because God is faithful to his calling. And in, in that calling, he calls us all to salvation. He calls us to repent of our sins and have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He calls us to faithfully serve him and to follow him. He promises to lead us in the paths of righteousness. He promises in Revelation chapter 1, we just... We just heard from our pastor to walk in the midst of the lampstands. Jesus walks in the midst of his churches. He is faithful to remind us of his promises and his calling to serve him and to live dedicated lives to him. One of the greatest joys is to see God call people to salvation. I, I never forget the experience as a 16-year-old in a five-day club in a backyard, seeing the very first kid I ever saw. After I shared uh, the wordless book and the gospel story, his eyes welled up with tears, and they began to stream down his face. And he said, I want to get saved. I, I can't ever get over that experience of leading that first one to Jesus. And I, I don't get over the experience of people coming and surrendering their lives and, and hearing the call of God to go wherever and to do whatever God calls them to do, whether it's in the remote mountains of China or Cambodia or in Africa. It doesn't matter. God's calling is that which he does. Now, I've already left my notes, John. I'm sorry. <laughs> but God has been faithful. And some of the, one of the most funny experiences I think I ever had, one of the slides, and, and this is in my notes, but one of the slides showed us, uh, or not slides, it was in the, the video. <laughs> Things change, don't they? Can you remember me wearing jeans to church? I've seen jeans and every Things change, but some things never change. Amen? How we get saved. And I just love it. But I, I saw the living Christmas tree. How many of you remember the living Christmas tree? How many of you stood in the tree? Okay. How many of you remember, all of a sudden, we were there in the living Christmas tree, and there's this huge, loud boom. And one of the guys fell out of the tree. And I've always thought he was out of his tree all the time anyway. <laughs> anyway, okay. Sorry, sorry, I may get back to my notes here. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, boy. You know, one of the greatest things is the, the fun we have. Our staff had more fun. And when we got that ping pong table up in the staff uh, gathering area. That was so much fun. But what I hated was when we first started doing that, uh, I could beat everyone. But shortly, I couldn't beat anyone. <laughs> they all beat me. <laughs> but, but we had a lot of laughs and a lot of fun. And God's people ought to laugh. They ought to have a lot of fun. Why? Because we have the greatest thing going. We have the love of God and the grace of God. Now, I know many times that God has shown his faithfulness through the years. He's shown them to me, to our church, to all of these ones that have come back that serve all over. And the, the joy of seeing God's faithfulness is just really overwhelming. 
he called me here in 1994, and it was a time when our church wanted to relocate. And, and uh, they had purchased the property, and I was so thankful uh, for the leadership that the church had at that time and for the vision of the church. But I remember after we had built the family center, the gym, we were worshiping there. We would built the youth building because the music was too loud to have in the, in the family center. And I said, we've got to get them out of here. We're, we're, we're going to run all the old people off if we don't get those kids and that music out of here. So we built the family center. Well, that's, that's the reason we built the youth center. You didn't know that, did you? Sorry. <laughs> you remember, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I remember we had built that. We were worshiping there. We had built the youth building. And, um, but I remember we went through the most trying times in our life. And uh, it was a crucible. It was a real fiery trial that really made us believe that we were done. Our ministry was over. We were, we were finished. But God, God was faithful to us. He gave us a faithful people that wouldn't give up on us. So after church that Sunday night, the church lined up. And for two hours and a half, we heard testimony after testimony after testimony, things I'd never heard that the people had gone through that they really hadn't shared with me. But that night they shared a lot of brokenness, a lot of trials, a lot of hurt, but that God had been faithful and he brought them all through it. And they looked at Diane and I as we listened to all of that and uh, they said, You've been with us through our trials, and we're going to be with you through your trials. And so we got a mountain of cards, hundreds of emails. They prayed for us in the next weeks. It was an experience that Diane and I have never, ever forgotten. And we've never gotten over it. You see, God is faithful to show up. He gave us faithful people who would not give up, but keep on going for Christ. And one of the greatest privileges is to be a part of a church of godly people. Oh, there's, there's always stinkers, aren't they? Well, the walls re reminded us. There are always stinkers amongst us, but I always say, hey, Jesus had Judas in the 12. Who am I not to have a few Judases? Amen. We're all going to have them, Pastor John. He knows that very well. But God is faithful in it all, isn't he? God is faithful. So through every trial we face, God is there. He said he'd never leave us, and he won't. I love that song. And he won't. He won't leave us. He keeps running after us. He keeps coming for us. He's still working when I don't see it. He's still working when I don't feel it. He's still working. Yeah. The new songs are pretty good. <laughs> Amen because they still testify of the faithfulness of God. So today, my greatest privilege every day is to pray for my pastor and his wife and for the staff and for a whole bunch of others I just love, and I'm, I'm praying for you. Because God tells us if we want a better pastor and wife, we want a better staff. We want a better church. We need to pray more. Pray more. Encourage, lift up, and love 
one another. And God will hear and God will answer our prayers. You believe that? Say amen. amen. I love you, Pastor John. Love you too. Thank you. You're my pastor. Thank you. Love you. All right. God is good. And all the time. He closed my notes out when he gave me a hug, so I gotta find it. <laughs> you know, I wasn't thinking about sharing this, I'll get out of my notes, but that night he was describing. And I had been on staff here a few years, and I often tell that story. That that night I saw uh, the opposite happen that I have seen my dad and my mom be faithful gracious merciful to people my, my entire life and it really was the first time that I saw the roles reverse and again I, I was 28 years old and it was a marker for me that you get back what you give. If you give grace and mercy and God's love, people will give it back. Uh, that principle we see in Scripture, the law of sowing and reaping, it's, you know, we typically talk about money when we talk about that, but it's way more than that, isn't it? And so... Uh, Thanks for bringing that up again. Make me cry. But I, I remember it well that night. In fact, I vividly remember my dad saying and explaining what was going on and then saying, so I'm offering you my resignation. And somebody yelled out, well, we don't accept it. And then the whole crowd stood up and started clapping. That was awesome. That is the legacy of Hallmark. Just giving grace. When I think about uh, the legacy, again, it, it is, and I'm not just saying this as kind of what I'm supposed to say, it is overwhelming to think that God has placed me in this situation. Because God has been faithful, and I just want to be faithful. Do you just want to be faithful to just do what God has called you to do? Uh, as I was uh, listening to those guys speak, I was just kind of scanning the audience, and I see quite a few former staff members. Um, if you're a former staff member of Hallmark, would you just stand up? Just wherever you're at, stand up. So, so I saw the Bakers and the Hayes and Brimmer and Jack French, <laughs> Singley, Chad and Stephanie. The Evans, the Wengers, the Blakes, uh, I'm not sure that is up there, the Switzers. Uh, the fact, here's, the, here's the truth, many of them served years ago at Hallmark, and the fact that they showed up today, it really speaks to y'all's faithfulness. This is a great church. It's a great church, and as we think about the Hallmarks of Hallmark, you know, we've been talking about them, it's not just some four core values that we came up with, the reality is this is what Hallmark has been about for 75 years. We, we've walked through these. The first one that we want to remind you of is that this church, and, and Pastor Wall spoke of this, this church it strives to be biblically driven. That's a core value. That's a Hallmark. That, in other words, we, we're not going to adjust the Bible to fit our lives. We're going to adjust our lives to fit the Bible. Because what culture tells us to do is not always what Scripture would have us do. Would you agree with that? And so whenever there is a contradiction between what culture says is okay and what Scripture says is okay, we as a church are always going to stand with God's Word. Amen? Amen? We are biblically driven. We are also personally involved. And again, every time I get an opportunity to talk to some of the people that have been here 40, 50 years plus, I hear of stories of well, when I got off work, we'd go over to the building and we would just start building. 
And our wives would cook meals for us. Isn't that awesome testimony? Faithfulness. Personally involved. We want to serve as the church, but we want to serve in the church. Number three is we has been a foundation, a hallmark of hallmark all these years is this church has been radically generous with their time, with their resources, with their talents. Um, as has already been mentioned, and Dave mentioned, our legacy is missions. And this week, now, I'm not a gambler. Just I'm going to get that right up front, okay? I, you know, it's, it's pretty easy these days to bet on sports if you didn't know that. Uh, but I, I, I choose not to do that. But I set the over underline way too low on you guys. Uh, how many of you saw the number I put on Facebook asking you, do you think since 1966 Hallmark has given more than or less than $10 million? How many of you say more? Okay, so if, if I were technically, if I were setting the betting line, I set it way too low. Because there was not one person that said less. All right? My eyes just adjusted. I see that's Gre Greg Tomasi. I, didn't, I couldn't recognize who you were standing. I'm sorry, Greg. I just had to interrupt that. Sorry, Greg. My eyes were filled with tears. I was like, who is that standing up there? <laughs> so I'll ask a question. How many of you think since 1966 that Hallmark has given more than $15 million to missions. Not, not, not the whole budget, just our missions budget. Who says more than $15 million? All right, who says less than $15 million? All right, all right, more than $20 million. Anybody say yes? Well, the reality is $21 million. 163000 Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. From my memory, which is not always the best, we've, we roughly spent about half of that building all these buildings. I love the fact that we've invested double overseas than we have in buildings. Doesn't, doesn't that excite you a little bit? That's awesome. That's, that's radically generous. Radically generous. The, the, the truth is, if you look on my Facebook, many people who have commented about our, our church celebrating 75 years are missionaries. Because we have supported and funded and prayed for missionaries all over the world. What a, what a great legacy. Radically generous. So this morning, I just want to spend a minute or so talking about our fourth hallmark, all right? The number four, if you're taking notes, is outwardly focused. So we are biblically driven, we are personally involved, we are radically generous, we are outwardly focused. When I think of the legacy of our church from 1947, the sacrifice it took to be radically generous to build a new building, but what would drive the radical generosity it's the outward focus. It's the, we need to lead more people to find and follow Jesus. Then years later when they outgrew that space and they moved to Morningside, and what would have driven the radical generosity, the involvement, the personal, it was, it was obviously the foundation of Scripture that the great commandment, the great commission, go make disciples. And they relocated to Morningside Drive, changed the name. I often wish that I could go back in history and sit in the room with those guys when they decided to change their name from Faith Baptist to Morningside Baptist. I wonder how difficult of a decision that was. I wonder how many conversations were in the room with those 19 men. I don't know if we, we've never done that before. Why would we do that? Why would we make the sacrifice? Why would we change the name? Because not everyone's going to like the new name, right? Because when you just think about Faith Baptist Church, it speaks to why they exist. They're a community, a church of faith. 
They changed their name to speak of who they are to where they are. And why would they do that? Wouldn't you have liked to have been a a part of those conversations? Because my assumption is that people in the 1950s didn't like change any more than the people in the 2020s. (laughs) Would you probably agree with that? And they outgrew that space, and it came time that we're going to have to decide if we're, going to, if we're going to lead more people to find and follow Jesus, we're going to have to relocate again. And we're going to have to move to a bigger location. We're going to have to build a bigger building, and it's going to take generosity, and it's going to take sacrifice, and it's going to take personally involved, and, and it's going to take a vision that there is more people out there that need to hear the gospel. And they relocated again. And you know what else they did when they relocated? They changed their name again. And I wonder how many, we just did this 10 years ago, really? We can't change our name again. They changed from Morningside Drive Baptist Church to Hallmark. And why would they change the name? Well, specifically that name was because they moved into the Hallmark area, the subdivision, the neighborhood. Again, I wonder what those conversations were like. Dare we change the name again? Yeah, if people are going to find the church, if they're going to find Jesus, our name should tell them where we're at. It should speak to that. And what would drive those things? I think it's because they were outwardly focused. We have a lot of examples in our church of decisions that we made that were outly focused, but what would drive us to that? I want you to turn to Luke chapter 15. We're going we're gonna to go quickly through this this morning. In Luke chapter number 15, many people, if, if you've taught much, you, you know where we're going, you know the story. There's like three different stories in Luke 15 of three different things that are lost. The sheep, the coin, and the son. But, but I don't want to go through all, all three of them. I, I just want to point out a few things quickly. Luke chapter 15, verse number 1. Then all the tax collectors and sinners... Okay, let's, let's identify who this is. This is... We could turn them and These are those people. Okay? You know what I'm talking about? I'm saying it's those people. It's the outsiders. It's not the religious group. It's not the church people. The tax collectors and sinners drew near to... Who who were they drawn near to? Jesus. It's interesting to me that the sinners, the outsiders, were drawn to Jesus. Why do you suppose they were drawn to Jesus? Well, I think Dave spoke to it. Love. Jesus said, they will know you by disciples by the love you have for one another. And I think just the love of Jesus drew people to him. You, you know how it is. When someone's gracious to you, isn't it easier to be a friend to them? It just, the crowds were, were just drawn to Jesus. And who was drawn to him? It wasn't the religious people. It was, it was those people. So we got some tension building here. Verse number two. The Pharisees and the scribes complained. Who are the Pharisees and scribes? If, if, if the tax collectors and sinners represent the outsiders, who do the Pharisees and scribes represent? The insiders, right? I didn't think that was that hard of a question, just to be honest with you. It's the church people. It's, it's maybe it's us. The church people. The religious people, the insiders, the ones that were ceremonially clean and can go to the temple. So do you see the contrast of groups that are gathered here? And what what do they do? They complained, saying, this man, what's the word? He receives. He accepts sinners. Who are the sinners again? It's 
It's the outsiders. It's the lost people. It's people that don't know Jesus. And they're mad because he eats with them. That's a big contrast, isn't it? The sinners, the outsiders are drawn to Jesus because of his love for them. And the church people are angry that Jesus is hanging out with those people. This is not an isolated event. It's not an isolated story. Turn, turn to Luke chapter 5, real quick. I'm just going to point it out, and then, and then we'll go back. Luke 5, verse 27. After these things, he, he being Jesus, went out and saw a tax collector named Levi. It's actually Matthew. He was sitting in the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. So Matthew, Levi, he left all, rose up, and he followed Jesus. Then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house. There was a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with him. The scribes, the Pharisees, uh oh, here we we go again, right? It's the same story. The tax collectors, the sinners, are eating with Jesus. The church people complained against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered and said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And we see the heart of Jesus. He is outwardly focused. The insiders were not. All right, Luke chapter 19. We got, we got to... I'm going to prove my point here, okay? Some of you are hard-headed, and you need to hear it three times. By the way, as he was telling the the story about Bob Young, how many of you do know who Bob Young is? Okay, look around. Look look around. What a, I mean, what a legacy of honoriness he left, right? The truth is, the Lord protected me from Bob Young. (laughs) I'm not lying. When I was in college, I came and just visited... And somehow ended up over on the pavilion helping them build, rebuild. You know, the one picture in the video where the, the roof was on the bottom? I had no part in that. I built the good one that's still standing, all right? I was standing on top up there. They were, they were uh, bringing one of the big trusts up. And on one end was Bob Young. On the other end was Frank Mercer. I don't know who these guys are. I'm just a college kid. Somehow got put to work. Well, I know how, but we won't talk about that, Dad. <laughs> a gust of wind came. They're holding on to it, and they're both going over. If I had known who it was, I'm not sure what I'd have done. <laughs> Just kidding. But I grabbed that thing, and we all stayed up on top. From that moment on, you know who was a fan of me? Bob Young. And God smiled on me for right, right? I don't that wasn't in my notes either. Luke 19. Jesus answered, verse 1, Jesus answered and passed through Jericho, entered and passed through Jericho. Now, behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus was what? A I was hoping y'all would sing it. He was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree. Remember, right? For the Lord he. You guys are so good. And as this, no, I'm not going to sing it. All right. He sought to, verse 3, he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd. And he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed in a sycamore tree to see him. He was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and, what, is, what are those two words? That's, those are two powerful words. Zacchaeus was hoping to see Jesus. But even better, Jesus saw him. That's an awesome two words. Jesus saw him and said, hey, Zacchaeus, come down. Or I'm going to your house today. (laughs) He gives his life to Christ. Hold on, though. Verse 7. But when they saw it, They all, what? Church people. 
Verse 10, but we'll get to the point. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was what? Lost. Jesus. Why, why would we as a church be outwardly focused? I'm, I'm not sure there's a better example than the fact that, well, Jesus was. Let's go back to our first story. I just wanted you to see this is not an isolated event. The church people condemned Jesus for hanging out with unchurched people. Okay? Verse 4. So Jesus, or excuse me, verse 3. Jesus spoke a parable to them. Verse 4. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which was lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing and when he comes home he calls together his friends his neighbors saying to them rejoice with me for i have found my sheep which was what lost i say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven let me say this again jesus is saying this there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Was Jesus outwardly focused? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Should we be outwardly focused? Yes or no? Yes. But let's be real clear. For us church people, that's sometimes difficult. It, re it really is. I'm, I'm not... Naive to say it's not. I've lived it my whole life. And if I'm not careful, if I'm not living a biblically driven life, it's not natural for me to be outwardly focused. It's not natural for church people to be outwardly focused. It's just not. I'm thankful that over the years that there have been faithful men who've stood up at this pulpit or several other pulpits in other locations and you know what they've led this church to do? Seeking to save that which is lost. That means reaching across the street and across the country, across the world. Three things I want you to think about that are very clear in this text. Number one, run after the lost. It's very easy to look inward, to protect, and to guard, and to shield, to hold on to. This church would not be here today if the men and women before us played it safe. They ran after the lost. Number two rescue the lost remember the old song rescue the perishing things haven't changed the fact is there are more people who need Jesus today than there were in 1947 the need to see people come to Jesus is greater now than 75 years ago when this church started and we cannot as a church, make a decision to play it safe. We must run after the lost and rescue the perishing. People need Jesus, don't they? And shame on me for not sharing it. Shame on me for having the heart of the Pharisees. Number three, rejoice when the lost are found. I think about 75 years of this church. There's a lot of people in heaven because of faithful people of this church. I pray a lot more will find Jesus in the next 75 years. Is that what you desire? Really? Is that what you desire? If that's going to happen, we must be biblically driven personally involved, radically generous, and outwardly focused. God's not done with Hallmark. 
He didn't bring us out here to leave us. The God who is faithful will continue to be faithful. But this morning, before I end this, I want you to think about the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus climbed a tree, as the song says, for the Lord he wanted to see. But as the text says, when Jesus passed that way, he looked up and he saw him. Today, maybe you're in this room and you need to know this. God sees you. And if you've never placed your faith in the hope of the gospel, that if you give your life to Jesus, you can have eternal life, you can have a home in heaven, you can have forgiveness of sins, you can have a restored relationship with God, those words, I think, are for you today. Jesus sees you. And what would he say to you? Come to Jesus. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes for a moment. Who would say this morning, John, I think that word's for me. I think Jesus is speaking to me right now. And right now in this moment, John, what you said, I, I, I want to I place my faith in Jesus right now, right in this moment. If that's you, would you just raise your hand right where you're at? It's dark. I may or may not see you, but just raise your hand. Just put it up right now. John, I want to give my life to Christ right now. I want to place my faith in Jesus. I believe Jesus sees me in this moment. Yeah, anyone else? Just put your hand up. Just put it up right now. And here's what I want you to do. Just pray and ask God to receive his grace. You may say something like this. God, I believe that Jesus died for me. And in this moment, I want to give my life to Jesus. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to save me. And if you prayed that prayer today, can I tell you, you've been adopted into the family of God. The greatest thing you could do is tell someone about it. Real, real quickly this morning, if you prayed that, could, could you just raise your hand right now just so I could pray for you? Just put your hand up right where you're at. Just put it up right now. I prayed that prayer. Thank you. Any, anyone else? For the rest of us in the room, be honest with yourself. Are you living an outwardly focused life? Is there someone on your prayer list right now that needs Jesus that you're praying for every day? Are you making intentional decisions to tell people about Jesus? To have relationships with people that need to find Jesus? And if not, I, I pray that today you would make that decision. God, I want to I wanna live an outwardly focused life. I'm going to ask you to stand with me this morning. And I'm going to give you a time of prayer. Maybe this morning you just want to come to the altar and pray, God, thank you for your faithfulness. Maybe, maybe this morning it's just to say, God, I, I do want to have a passion for lost people. Would you just come pray right now? Just, just come forward to the altar. God, maybe it's just thankful for the 75 years, thankful for this church, thankful for the legacy, thankful for your part in being generous, thankful for God's faithful. Just come and pray this morning. Maybe this morning it's, God, I want to have an outwardly focused I want, to, I want to see people. I want to have a burden for lost people. I want to pray for lost people. I want to seek out the lost. I want to run to them. I want to rescue them. And I want to celebrate them giving their life to Christ. Just come forward and pray right now.